So, looks like we are live. Everyone is sound. Are we live? Um, ah, yeah, now we are. We are? Yeah, people are coming in. Excellent. Come on, lovely people, join us. Slowly, slowly, the room is filling up. Yeah, it's actually pretty fast. Faster than rooms normally fill up. So, <laughs> hello everyone. So I think we wait one or two minutes until everyone's Hi, got their hands Hi, David. <clears throat> Pretty cool. All right, all right, all right. So are we going? I think we should. Let's go, yeah. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this webinar. It's going to be a lot of fun. I've been looking forward to this day for quite some time. Um, this is going to be a, quite an extraordinary uh, webinar, I believe, especially because we're bringing together two worlds, two different wine styles, and <laughs> Uh, all realize that they have quite a lot in common, actually. So, so um, without much further ado, I just kind of quickly want to introduce myself, um, and uh, then I will talk about Ted Lemon of Literai, and Sebastian will introduce himself and talk about uh, Dominic Sona and Köhler Ruprecht, and then we'll jump right into the real webinar. So. My name is Konstantin Baum. I'm a master of wine and I do quite a lot of things. I run my own import and distribution business, but I also um, am the education ambassador for the California Wine Institute in Europe. So um, it's a great pleasure to talk to and um, about one of the wineries that are really important for the Californian wine scene because um, Ted Lemon and Literai have brought a completely new approach to winemaking to California. And uh, he's been a pioneer in what, he, what, what he's doing. So um, Ted actually started his winemaking career in Burgundy. He was the first American to run a domain in Burgundy. Um, and and uh, this is kind of how he got his entry into, into the wine scene. He then moved back to California and uh, looked for a place to set up his own winery in the early 90s and settled in Sonoma, where he founded Literai with his wife Heidi. And they are now making wines from uh, different, uh, different vine vineyards in the Sonoma coast, in the real Sonoma coast and in Anderson Valley. Ted also uh, helped found Burn Cottage a Winery in uh, New Zealand, where he also got involved with uh, the person that kind of brought this whole thing together today, because uh, the owner of Burn Cottage is also the owner of Köhler Ruprecht. And when they looked for a new um, head winemaker, a new person to run the winery, Ted kind of uh, set up the connection between Köhler Ruprecht and Dominik Sona. So I'm handing over to you, Sebastian, and, um, and uh, your part with the introduction of uh, Dominik and Köhler Ruprecht. So let's do this. Thank you, Konstantin. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bauthäuser. So skip, skip the family name. It's Sebastian. It's easier. And um, I've been working as a sommelier, sommelier in the fine dining for, for over 20 years uh, until I quit like 2014 and to went to work on myself. I, I work in uh, sensor, sensory control, quality control. I do education. I, I write books. I'm an um, accredited uh, Bordeaux tutor. I um, have some deals with some regions. I, I like the wines of um, Alto Adige. I like Portuguese wines. Um, champagne, of course, just to give you an idea for, for my core interests. And of course, I do like German wines and I do like Riesling. And actually, there's a lot of Riesling around here. But when it comes to the very, very core of essential wines, essential Riesling, who have always been great and who always will be great, um, I think there's no way not to come across Köhler Ruprecht. 
And there are many sites, great sites, just like in Burgundy, where we have the Grand Cruz, which <coughs> always have been great vineyard sites for Riesling in Germany. And for sure, um, the one we're talking about tonight is one of them. But uh, first of all, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the man himself, Dominik Zona. Uh, he went to Köhler Ruprecht, I think, in 2008. Um, um, the history of, or even earlier. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, physically in 2010. Physically. As a CEO, yeah, right. Um, and ever since, um, you've been the man in charge, right? That's what uh, that's what uh, people say about me. That's what people <laughs> tell me. I don't always feel like it, but it, uh, that's that's what it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, started in 2010, and uh, with the blending, I was involved in the blendings of 2008, which happened in 2009, when uh, things were clear that I will start working for Kolobrecht in, in 2010 after the 09 harvest. Yeah. Yeah. And since then, I'm in Karlstadt, uh, enjoy, enjoy a busy life, and uh, of course, enjoy reason. That's the most important, <laughs> you know, pleasure we have these days. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crucial when you work for Kula Ruprecht to be enjoying Riesling, that's for sure. So I think um, we kind of kick off the, the tasting right away, um, because I think it makes more sense to, to get, get into the wine straight away and then while we are tasting and drinking, um, we, we can talk more about um, yeah, the, the whole history and the winemaking philosophy and so on and so forth. So um, everyone who's ordered the wines can actually now pour them if, they, if you haven't. Uh, we, I think we all have poured them a uh, little, little bit ahead because it makes a lot of sense to give those, both of those wines a little bit more air. So, um, yeah. Go ahead and zip, uh, have, a, have a sip of wine. I'll actually show you um, where, where we are, where we are, where we are going to start in the Faust. And uh, Sebastian and Dominic will talk a little bit more yeah. about, about the wine. Yeah, okay, you start the presentation. Yep. That's where, where we are all together. Yep, that's uh, and now we're getting, getting, getting closer. The hot spot. Yeah. The Grundschule Karlstadt is also yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> quite dominant in that. In that I think map. it's actually a bus stop. <laughs> 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 I once traveled there by bus, which only few people do, because I think uh, most of them, you, you need a car. Nobody does it. So, as I said, I don't know if, if uh, each and every one of you is familiar with the uh, um, Köhler Ruprecht, but uh, Köhler Ruprecht is a... Um, is a house with a long tradition. And um, this tradition is really strongly connected with um, the site, the winemaking, vinification and everything. And the site, of course, as one of the greats in Palatine, and if not Germany, is the um, Saumagen, which literally translates to the pig's stomach. There's only speculations about how the name came up. Some say it's because the, um, the side is a bit shaped like a pig's stomach, but it's not the side. I mean, um, we have to go way back till 1810 to 1830s when the name first popped up in documents and was defined in its outlines but it has changed ever since. That means uh, not for good, but in fact, for bigger. It has been enhanced um, a couple of times. So there is something like the original Saumagen and the Saumagen today. And as in Burgundy, it's not only about the side. You always will have to know who is doing the wine on this special side. And it's same here who is doing the wine on this single side and in which part today. I think Dominic can talk about this later. So one thing, if we talk about Köhler Ruprecht, of course, is tradition. I mean, if you look at the label, if you got the label in your hand, it's, it's, it's a really nice, lovely old school label on the bottle, which never changed. 
And um, it's not the only thing that never changed. Another thing is the winemaking. It's still, Köhler Ruprecht is one of the last, or if not the very last, a winemaker in Palatine who exclusively um, makes the wine in old wooden barrels. So there have been not only changes in, in the site Salmagen, but in the winemaking in Germany itself. And in the, in the 60s, when cellar technique and, and engineering came up, everybody was going um, insane about this and, and changing to stainless steel, which of course changed the style of the wines. But then Köhler Ruprecht, they've, they've always been pretty much like this. So I would say old school, but it's, I don't know if it's an old school or it's the only school or true school, but that's not the point here. And um, another specialty of, the, uh, of, of Köhler Ruprecht is um, the um, strong ties to the German system of predicates. So, German wine laws is not only confusing to us Germans ourselves, but I think it's even more confusing to, to the people outside of Germany. So you have um, the VDP, you have the German wine law, you have this predicates, you have the like cabinet, and then you have a cabinet trocken or a cabinet sweet. Some say it's only expected to be sweet and um, some say it's, it's not. So here we're having an Auslese and Köhler Ruprecht always was doing dry wines so no sweetness here so you might be tempted to think it's a sweet wine when you see Auslese which in the German wine law way of thinking should be sweet but it is not it's something like an internal classification of Kulaubrecht that say Cabinet is of course the lightest refreshing wine the Spätlese is maybe more mineral and the Auslese is it's like the Porsche, you know, the, the, the more, most powerful one, but not lacking elegance. So it's, an, it's, it's rather a definition of, of categories than uh, a, a, a sticking to sugar levels while harvesting. And uh, all these three things together, I think, make this wine, the history of the wine and the greatness of the wine. Uh, Dominic entered uh, Köhler Ruprecht in 2010. And whenever some, 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 someone new comes to, um, to, to, um, to a winery or to any place, um, pretty often they want to change things, how they've been done uh, before. But uh, Dominic didn't. He, he kept it pretty much like it was. But he was doing fine tuning here and there. So um, by respecting the style of the house, and, uh, and of the wines, um, he was, I think, uh, and, and he pretty managed pretty good to um, to have the wines even more refined without denying their character or tradition. And this is uh, very very fun to see, especially in this sixteen, which I, I which so shows perfectly um, tonight here in the glass. So, Dominic, this was just a yep. short introduction on you. I didn't want. To bother you with telling all this, so let's talk. Talk the sixty hours laser wine. <clears throat> talk about the wine. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> first of all, everything's so far so good. Um, what we def <clears throat> define for the house laser would be the golden and amber colored berries. So that's our picking grade. Not necessarily looking at the the must weight. Uh, in 2016, we actually had to look at the must weight to reach the house laser level, and we barely reached it. So we just reached the 92 X level, which is so the minimum must weight for our laser and falls. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a brilliant year. It's been uh, a, another warm year, but it kind of had the, has those in the wine, like the cool climate flavors, cool vintage flavors, like even the acidity is there, which is uh, Brilliant for a hot year, so it's uh, it's, it's most most of the acidity is sateric acid, which is a big surprise, and um, and uh, there was no rain, no you know no mist for I think eight weeks, and we were picking grapes for six weeks straight. Uh, we even had a break in between, and uh, and this was one of the last the last picks. There's one higher level of this wine, which will be the R, the reserve wine, um, uh, but this is already. Like you said, uh, if you want to 
compared with cars, it would be the whatever Porsche or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, and and then we go up to the 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 next one would be the I don't know the Tesla maybe <laughs> in the future. <laughs> It's, it's in the future, R or double R, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, when you look at the the yellow button and the where the Cologne operator state is, uh, the Saubergen is just uh, the main part is just like that's where the the white the, the mouse is. And yeah, a little bit further to the to the right, to the left, to the left, to the left. Uh, yes, and then down. Yeah, more or less. So those are terraces, and that's the south-facing slope, and yeah. that is where that is. I mean, we we do a true pick in all the blocks in the Salman, but this is our main main vineyard, most important vineyard where we get the best, usually the best grapes, and then the best wines out. Yeah. Well, and, so how, uh, how do the um, different vineyards in the Saumagen um, um, differ in terms of exposition and? So what what we see right now is is all where the mouse is. That's where south facing is, and you see the you see the um, <laughs> AMG. <laughs> uh, you see the the sporting field, the soccer field. Uh, this is all east facing. Uh, okay. Further up, further up. Uh, and then to the left, that's the soccer field. And this is all east facing uh, Saumagen. This is Terra Rosa in this area, so the red limestone. And mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in our south facing is, is a little bit more like white limestone yeah. uh, with, a list, with also less high less content, which is mm -hmm. a rich soil. There's no water, water problems. It's just like perfectly growing every mm -hmm. year. So it's uh, pretty pretty good. But 16 is one of my favorite vintages and I, I told it to every customer and to all of my friends if there's another vintage like 16, I retire immediately after it. It's just too perfect. I, I'm not sure if there, I don't think there, I don't have a plan B yet, but I don't think there will be another vintage like 16. It's just like the acidity, the balance, the, the etheric, you know, flavors and the, the structure of the wine and it's, uh, it's the it's still a young wine, so it's meant to be drank in, in another 15 years, maybe. But it's mm -hmm. already showing what, what's, what's there. And also the harvest was so easy. The, the, the season, the growing season was easy. We didn't have to work much, and <laughs> which is like, it's always good when you don't have to, you know. So you didn't have any problems with Peronospora in, in 16 in, no, in no, springtime. No, no, no. So we you were, were blessed, right? We were really lucky, yes. yes. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, a little bit further to the east in the flat vineyards, and there were, there were a couple issues, yeah. not in South Mountain, not at all. Yeah. So, hey, for, for yeah. Can I ask you a question? Can you go back to the bigger picture for those of us who are not specialists in the faults on where the tradition of making uh, truck and wines came from at KR? In other words, was this a long time tradition of the faults or was this a real peculiarity of, of Kohler Rubrik? If you, I think if you uh, look at Germany, it is a long, in, in Pfalz is the longer tradition to make dry wine than in other places for Riesling and for other places than in, uh, in, in uh, Germany. And uh, in Pfalz especially, I think Kohler Rubrik was one of the first starting, well, of course they, they made it back in the, before the 350s, 60s, 70s. Uh, they did make sweet wine, a little bit of sweet, more sweet wine in the 70s as well, but then they changed in the 80s and 90s to, to mainly dry wines. And, that, and in this case, they were the first doing, doing that uh, again, the first again, doing, doing mainly dry wines, yeah. And what, um, what, what made, why, why that transition? Why did they trans, transition to mostly dry? <clears throat> What well, I think, uh, I think that is uh, the personal flavor, personal taste of the, of the previous owners of the, the Filippi family, uh, as well as the, probably the a chance uh, to, I mean, we don't have a lot of, you know, we don't have a lot of mist. We don't get the perfect botrytis. The botrytis here is always a little wet. Um, the wines are not as, you know, as precise. precise. Sweet wines are not as precise as the, the, the Mosel or the, the Rheingau uh, Auslese or Bären Auslese. Uh, so maybe that was one of the reasons as well as, um, you know, 
putting a having a new niche for the wines. You know, and everyone made sweet wine, they made dry wine. And as soon as uh, the demand for dry wine was a little higher, the, uh, the, the demand was there. The people came came first to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And did I have another question on that, if I can, Constantine? Which yeah. is, was it was it uh, was that controversial, Dominic? I mean, was was KR looked as 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 a rebel, or I mean, I know you weren't there then, or anything. The, but I'm just curious uh, about uh, the historical nature vis-a-vis -vis the neighborhood. Yeah. K KR was a, was more a rebel in terms of keeping the barrels than making always dry wines. And so we're talking, keep, we're talking keeping about the barrels, keeping the barrels, keeping the wild ferments, uh, basically focus on the 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 you know the previous um, um, organization of the VDP. That's the natural wine auction here. So keeping the focus on the natural wine, um, which is uh, which. Uh, Basically, that they said that they don't want to chapterize. That's why we still stick with the predicates because the predicates one is never chapterized. And I think that's kind of more the rebel thing than uh, than moving on to uh, dry or sweet wines. Yeah. And then, just to be clear, we're talking about casks, not small barrels. Exactly. Um, uh, 300, 600, 1200, 1500, and 2500 liters, yeah. which is uh, a stück barrel, which be which is twelve hundred liters a piece. That's how we call it. Yeah, like twelve hundred a dozen. Uh, yeah, not would I, not. Would I find quite interesting. Yep. Sorry, Dominic. What what I find quite interesting in having you two here in this webinar, and, and I and I already see from Ted's uh, questions that that um, well that there is is maybe some more background that needs to be explored um, there uh, is. The fact that you both kind of represent very distinctive wineries that follow their own path. But the main difference, at least in my opinion, is that Ted kind of started with a blank slate and uh, in, in a place that was a blank slate, basically. So, so in the Sonoma Coast, not a place that was known for, for winemaking, whereas Dominic um, started well, in a winery with a lot of tradition in a place that has been making wine for a long, long time. So, so my question, and it might be a good transitional question as well to kind of move on to, to Ted's wine, uh, is Ted, for you, what, what's your, what, what, do you, um, what do you miss in terms of, I, I, I personally see a lot of advantages in starting with a blank slate, slate but for you, what, what is the big advantage in having such a such an interesting history, such a long history that you can fall back on when you're making wine and wine making decisions. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a, it's a great question, but it's an it's an easy one, right, to answer, Constantine. I mean, just when you were drawing the outline of Salmagen, right, the ability to just knowing that the vineyard is great is is huge. In other words, there's an enormous history of Salmagen or any other number of Grand Cru type sites around Europe that we all know make great wine. And so really your job, you know, if you're taking over an estate there or whatever is, is to live up to the expectation of that site. And when, they're, when you're working in a region that's unknown, no one knows what to expect. And a lot of times they actually spend more time projecting what they think you should be doing on you, right? Than, <laughs> than allowing you to discover the place that you're working in. So. I mean, I found working in Burgundy and, and loving European wine as much as I do that that it's it's like a drug. It's hard to give up, Constantin, right? I mean, where you when you're working with Claude La Roche, boy, that's a pretty good drug, and and you can feel pretty confident, and um, uh, you feel like you've always got a parachute, I guess, in some ways would be the analogy. Whereas when it's all new, you know, who knows? I mean, every year is a discovery. But, but on the other hand, it doesn't feel, or it isn't as easy to disappoint people, maybe, if you're, if you're messing up your Clos de la Roche uh, fruit uh, and make a wine that is not representative of that, might be, uh, might be more embar embarrassing than, than uh, right. messing up the fruit of a vineyard that doesn't have, any, have a name, right? Absolutely. And of course, if you're, you know, to take that Burgundian model, if you're lucky enough to have three or four Grand Cru's in your cellar, um, and they don't taste the way they should. Yeah, that's a problem, right? There's no separation of flavor. That's a of taste. That's huge. 
Um, but if there's but, no history to that side, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I mean, how do you know if, if, I mean, if you messed it up or if just the, the place isn't good? I mean, you have to find out as well, right? Because you can't rely on anything. Sure, for us, you do. You have to figure out whether it's a good place. I think that's where, Sebastian, the European history is so important, right? And we, all of us tend to forget, at least I do, maybe you guys don't, that you know, European viticulture is an inheritance from um, the, the, uh, the Middle East and that, that it came up through Greece and Turkey, et cetera, and, and later into Italy. And so Europe really has this enormous foundation. Well, we stand on the same foundation. It just is that it's more European. So that ability, I mean, first time I went to, to Kola Ruprecht, the first time I was in Kalstadt, right? Yes. I, I didn't, I was with Dominic. So of course he showed me Salmagen, but he didn't need to show me that that was a great vineyard. I mean, you can just stand there and you can smell it, right? It's south facing. It's got that beautiful, I can't remember what percent slope is, but gentle to, to moderate slope. And that's the brilliance of European viticulture is if you, if you spend enough time visiting the great vineyards of Europe, you can smell what a good site is, or what, at least what site that has great potential. Now, is it gonna be you know, the best or a B grade? You never know, but you can tell. But on the other hand, for you, Dominic, how, I mean, you, you made wine uh, in California, right? You, you, you worked, worked abroad before. So do you sometimes feel like you would love to be in a place where, where, where not every law is already written and everything is kind of uh, set in stone and you could in, 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 what, in what you want to do? In case of, uh, that's a good expression that not every law is written. I, I, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's a pretty good expression because uh, here things are, you know, they for sure we know the sites, we know how to do things. It's, uh, it's probably much easier, but uh, if you wanna, it's it, like the, the excitement is still there, but if you're, if you're up for an adventure, I'm not sure if Europe is the right place. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's everything, or oh, not everything, but there's a lot of things which are set. Um, and, uh, and if you think that, you know, especially these days with the climate change, you know, if, if you, you, I mean, are things still the same in five or 10 years? And, uh, but if you're stuck in, in a village in France where you can only plant one variety, Like what do they do in 15 years or in 20 years? We are a little Germany is a little bit uh, more liberal, but still, um, still uh, there's uh, the new world is a little you know if they if it doesn't grow well they, they take the vineyard out and let trees grow and then they move on to the next part. I mean that's how they developed <clears throat> most of their countries. Um, yeah. So that that is a little bit more of a a little bit more of a freedom, at least in your mind, but if the wine is as good or can be as good, then I think they need to work way harder on the, on the, on the plant and on the, in the cellar to, to, to get what they want, probably. Yeah. yeah. And that is um, a little e easier in Europe, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a brief, brief point uh, that I just want to make, make, I think I didn't make, make it in the beginning. Um, it's great if you have questions, just answer them. And there's one, qu uh, just, uh, just ask them in the chat and, and we'll try to answer them all. Um, there's one question on the Köhler Ruprecht Pinot, uh, whether it's grown in the same area, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a, another block around a, a little bit further south. But most is around the village. Uh, the Pinot is more or less mostly around the village. Um, mm -hmm. There's one block. Uh, it's a little bit. Um, yeah, it's basically around the village. That's where we all, where are the Pinot varieties, uh, uh, the Pinot vineyards, and um, uh, not in Saumagen. Saumagen is Riesling. And one little block of Muscatella, <laughs> uh, but the rest is uh, the, the Pinot is around the Salmagen. Yeah. Right. Dominic, can I ask you the question about Salmagen that maybe is implied in some of what Constantine was saying, which is, yes. you know, when you when you took it over, okay, you've got the givens of, you know, maybe some constraints of spacing and orientation and stuff. 
but I know you've done a lot of work to try to improve the soils, et cetera. And can you, can you speak to me as somebody from the new world about what it's like to try to, you know, get the soils to be healthier when you inherit a place that's been farmed for so long? Well, that's, that is a, a question we still work on <laughs> from, from year to year. Uh, well, I mean, the, the most essential and easiest way to start is, is the cover crop, right? That's, that's, one, that's something we, we do every alternate every year. That's something we, we have to do. And then we, uh, we do work with uh, more and more with the uh, uh, compost, but m mostly own done compost. You know, we have that uh, SK. SK is a big problem in, uh, in, in virus as well as a big problem in old vineyards. Um, there's, uh, there's blocks, uh, there's uh, in uh, just the neighbor village further south, there's an old Roman press house and uh, you know, it's been an, an old Roman press and farmhouse, so that's that's how long there are vineyards, and uh, you can see that there's huge huge problems. So we, in some vineyards, we just have have them, uh, you know, unplanted for a couple of years to get the to get the to rest the soil, and now we work a little bit with the Terra Preta products, which is like a little like the biochar, uh, to to activate again the the the, the soil. Uh, Fertility um, and, and life, life in soil, not not necessarily fertility in speaking fertilizers. Yeah. That, so that, is, that is something. It's that's not something. about legumes, right? It's not about trying to increase nitrogen. It's about no, 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 no. no. It's the yeah. life in the soil. Just you know, just to get the bio, biodiversity. Not you know, we see when we talk about biodiversity, we talk about the vineyard, the green, everything we see. But there is a lot of biodiversity in the soil. At least it should be in the soil, and that's what we try to reactivate because it's uh, it's there is there there are blocks out there who are suffering for two thousand years of viticulture. That's that's for sure. Um, but uh, but we uh, we uh, yeah it's a it's a long process. Um, but uh, but we, we're getting there slow slowly. And, um, and uh, I mean you guys are. Uh, I think you don't, you guys have your soil, and you don't need to, you know, plow it or, or cultivate it as probably as often as we have to. Um, and uh, so we have to build it up um, and, and not only use it for now. Yeah. And mark the mainly soil types in Saumang is loose loam and limestone. To answer that question. All right. And did the wines taste different from those different soils? Uh, they do. Uh, if you do the blind tasting with the different, different barrels, uh, you, you pick out the barrels from Salman for sure. Uh, not necessarily saying that you can pick up the barrel from the Terra Rossa. Yeah. But uh, there is a huge difference between Salman and not Salman. That's a huge, huge difference, which is always nice. <laughs> and, and for those of us who don't know Karlstadt well, is there another sort of, or there are other very special vineyards within Karlstadt? Not the KR farms them necessarily, but just vineyards that are as famous as Salmagen? Uh, no, not, not really. I mean, there's the Annaberg, which, which we farm a little bit of Chardonnay in there. Um, but, uh, but the most important is the Salmagen vineyard. And uh, probably the most important north of uh, the, the epicenter, which is, uh, which is Deidesheim and Forst. I mean, that's, it is, like Sebastian said, it is one of the most important and best Riesling vineyards in the area, of, if not in Germany, for dry Riesling. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And um, I'm, I, I can say that with pride because I'm, I'm, I'm not owning it. And I'm not from the village, so I can say it with pride. So, yeah. You like to hang around. Eh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, uh, we we get back to to Dominic, obviously, um, but I think it's time to also have a snip of the Pinot. So for that, we need to fly uh, around the Change world. planets. <laughs> yeah, pretty much feels a bit like that. So so um, this is um, this is where Litera is based, the Sonoma Coast AVA. Um, it's generally shaped like a lobster. If you use your imagination, you'll, you'll see it, but um, see the claws right at the, at the, along the coast. And then um, 
goes deep into um, Caneros. So, so it's actually a pretty big AVA and there's still quite a lot of controversy about whether this uh, should actually be one AVA um, or whether it should be broken up or whether we need a, a clear definition of what the coast is actually. But um, this is where, where uh, Ted found his, his spot where, where he decided to settle down. Uh, literary means coasts. So, so um, I don't know whether the name existed before you found the place or whether, whether you, you decided to name it that because you were at the coast. I, from what I gathered, you actually uh, definitely wanted to have something somewhere along the coast because you wanted to have a, a cool climate. And that is obviously crucial when it comes to um, California and the climate in California is that the Pacific is the main uh, engine for <laughs> for influencing the, the climate. The Pacific is a pretty cold ocean bringing uh, cold water from the North Pole along the coast and wherever that um, air that comes with the water actually gets into, onto, onto land, it cools down the climate quite a bit. And that's why um, the, the places right at the coast are much cooler than most of the places further inland. Um, and, and this is also one of the reasons why there's a bit of contro controversy with that, whether the AVA actually represents the real coast because um, the further you go inland, especially if you go up to Healdsburg, uh, the, the impact of the Pacific is obviously far less pronounced um, than it would be right, right on the coast. But um, we are going to taste well, this is just an image um, of, of the Sonoma coast. Um, obviously, the coast is very diverse, so there are a lot of lots of different views. But um, this is a beautiful view. That's why it's included in this presentation. And it kind of shows that it is different to, uh, for example, the Napa Valley, probably one of the places that most people know best from California. Um, it, is, it is much more isolated. There's much more nature. There are, um, small pockets of vineyards. It's not all planted to vines. Um, there's no monoculture as such um, in, in those uh, places at, on the real Sonoma coast. So, so it's a bit, bit of a different place. And it's one of the most beautiful places um, for me. I, I actually wanted to drive up the coast this summer, um, but that didn't work out for obvious reasons. But, but, but I'll, I'll come back and, and do that next time. So. So let's have a look at the winery. Um, this is where Ted and Heidi settled down uh, with, their, with their winery. It's actually 12 hectares or what, 30 acres, right? Um, yeah. uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, ground, but it's not all planted to vines. Just, just a few acres are actually planted to, to a vineyard, which is this vineyard here, right? Mm -hmm. the, the pivot uh, vineyard so um, and that's obviously the wine that we are we are tasting or hopefully everyone's tasting but I'm guessing not everyone has it in in its glass but um, yeah talk a little bit about about uh, the pivot in particular and uh, what you what why you decided to plant your vineyard or that one vineyard you're obviously sourcing fruit from lots of different places but why you decided to settle down there the, um, so you can see from these great pictures that this part of the Sonoma Coast is, is a little more farmland-ish than um, the north, which is more heavily forested. And uh, as Constantin suggested, um, there, there will be a, the Sonoma Coast, I won't say it'll be chopped up, the ABA will continue to exist, but it's going to be, there's going to be a West Sonoma Coast ABA in a minute. But this is a pretty good perspective on our property. Basically, the winery going up is the is the property, the forest to the left, the pivot in the middle, and then those open fields, which we hay and are part of our compost stream. So the goal is to maintain a diversified farm uh, and to have a diversified wine farm. Let me get rid of that. Sorry about that. Um, that uh, that can be sort of a fertility center for the rest of our vineyards. So this is where we make the compost, etc. But right now you can see from the picture that it's a gentle south facing slope. So uh, those rows are running north south. And um, 
it really is sort of the heart of the, um, of the property for us and um, uh, really was the reason for buying this particular property. And as some of the people on the call will know, Literai makes a lot of vineyard designated Pinot Noir, so uh, more than 10 different vineyard designates. This is one of the estates. It's obviously one of the most important uh, to us because of uh, the fact that it's where the winery is located. And um, the goal here is, um, if we can, to dry farm, which we have been doing for the last four years. So this, this piece is no longer irrigated. And um, it produces, I think, really the wines you have in the glass constant, and they're very, they're, they have a fruit which is, yes, they have California fruit, but to me, I don't know what you would say, but it, it's almost more of a, uh, a, a vegetal, um, you know, underripe blackberry or raspberry. It's, it's a kind of a crunchy fruit quality. I, I don't know how you would describe it, but it's not the classic big fruit California wine. I think that the 17 is very typical of what this site produces. I don't know, what, yeah. what's your impression of it? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, for me, those wines, all of the wines that you're making have a pretty clear handwriting. And I alluded a little bit in the introduction to the fact that you learned your craft in Burgundy. Where this story is quite long, so, so I, I, I don't think it will have, we have enough time to talk about it all, but, but it's, it's quite exciting uh, how you fell into um, different, or got into different wineries and worked into different wineries and then uh, ran Guy Rodeau in, in Merceau as the first American. So what, what would, would obviously be like the obvious connection would be to say this is uh, Burgundy made in California, but it's, it's not. I mean, um, you, you're obviously looking to express the cool places in California and the, the, the wines that come from those uh, vineyards that are very much influenced by the Pacific Ocean and um, and and by by sourcing fruit from from those vineyards from those those very cool places you're actually um, showing showing a to totally different expression of what California is able to offer and for me as a as a taster it's not Burgundian as such it's it's very Californian but but um, it is it is uh, it is this bright fruit, this very um, uh, intense cherry fruit flavor, um, the polishness of, of of the flavor, and the the um, the the great integration with slightly spicy notes or herbaceous notes um, like like black tea that are very thought through um, and very well made, including this chiseled. Uh, Sizzle tannin and and the beautiful acidity, acidity, acidity which, which is very well integrated. So so for me, it's it's not a not a typical Burgundian wine. It's just a, a cool climate expression uh, from California. And and uh, this is obviously something that you pioneered as one of the one of the one, first wineries that were actually making wine in the in the true Sonoma coast. But um, it's certainly something that we see much more now than we. Did in the in the early 90s, um, more more winemakers are brave enough now to to do something like that, and um, it's it's exciting. It's a very exciting wine. I, I mean, this is obviously also a baby, but it's already very approachable for me. Um, it's it's very tempting to to drink it now, but I but I'm pretty sure that it will um, last for quite a bit longer. Even though this is actually from a very young vineyard, right? This was planted in 2004, so so 13 years is not a long time for, for Pinot, Pinot Noir vines to develop. If you go back one slide, Constantin, I, I don't know if you can go back to the map. Yeah. Can you go back and we'll just... That was the picture? Uh, or? Before the picture, right? Yeah. There you go, I guess it's two slides back. Yeah. Uh, there we go. You had the, yeah, there we go, with the AVA on it. So if you take your cursor, Constantin, and go from the G in Guerneville, up above, yeah, keep going up. You see the G in Guerneville to your right? Yeah, you don't have to go in closer. You can, you can scroll back out if you can. I don't know if we'll be able to do this to you and I from a distance. Where do you want me to go? See that, see the G right next to you in Guerneville? Yeah. Okay, if, if, you, if, you, if you can scroll out 
scroll out okay a little bit yeah let's see if we can get the two of us can manage to pull this okay that's good enough yeah you can stop right there and if you draw a line with your cursor from the G and Burnville down between Litteri and Winery. Just, just draw it, yeah, right there and go keep going straight down just like you're doing over to your right between Litteri and Winery. But this way. Uh, oh. No, on a horizontal, on a on same, same direction as the line above it, sort of going from upper left to lower right. So you're going to go towards, Burnville. Towards Santa Rosa or? No, um, from, from uh, the winery W to yeah. the Granville G. Yes, exactly. Okay, so it's like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that <laughs> line, that line, if you continue that line south from the, the W in winery, that will be the West Sonoma Coast AVA. All right, okay. Uh, okay. So that, that AVA has been sitting at our beautiful government, which we will not speak about on this phone call, um, for the last few years. And there's no real controversy remaining about it, but it's our attempt to fix the fact that you alluded to that the Sonoma Coast is just way too big. So the West Sonoma Coast will essentially be all of the areas that are dark green, including going all the way up to Hirsch and Flowers up north. So all of that long string bean, right, will become the West Sonoma Coast AVA. And as your photo, photo showed, the key thing to understand is this is really rough mountainous country. There's not a lot of vineyards out there. The area where the pivot is, is the most settled, the most sort of farmland-like. And a lot of it is, is dense timber. Will never be planted. So I got a question that, that is, um, yeah, basically to, to both of you, uh, Dominic and, and Ted. <laughs> Um, which is obviously quite interesting is um, you're both kind of doing your thing on two different parts of, of the, the planet, but, but some, there's, there are quite a few similarities there. And one similarity is that both of you um, like organic and biodynamic viticulture, but you're not really um, committed to getting certified uh, for that. I mean, um, as far as I know, both of you have uh, have no interest in getting getting a certification for for um, organic or biodynamic viticulture. Would you maybe uh, Ted start with uh, your reasoning? Why why don't you think uh, it's necessary to um, to get get the certificates uh, for for organic or biodynamic viticulture? Yeah, it's a it's a big subject, but. Um... Very briefly, for us, what matters to us is the work and doing the work that's involved and, and not the, what we call in English, the gold star, right? The certification or the stamp yeah. of approval of either the government or some private organization. So we just want to do the work, Constantin, and I don't really, certifications are fine. They have a role to play. And if somebody wants to criticize us, for, you know, for saying, well, how do I know you're doing what you claim? That's fine. I totally accept that criticism. The only thing I can say in response to that is come visit, you come see what we're doing and, and you tell me if you, if you like it or not. Um, but it, it's really about the passion for the work and um, uh, a feeling as a, as a first generation winery that I just don't want to spend my life filling out paperwork. You know, I just, yeah. I'd, rather, I'd rather farm. And it's also, I assume, more difficult if, if you don't own all of the vineyards, right? I mean, you're, you're like roughly 50-50 um, in terms of uh, estate-grown fruit, 50% and 50% bought in. So, so right. I'm guessing that that's quite, would be much more difficult to handle with your suppliers. Like right. So the estate stuff, you could say, as you just did, you know, well, you should go ahead and certify. Um, and I gave you the reason why not. For the grower wines, yeah, that would be that would be entirely driven by the individual growers. So um, we have Wendling Vineyard up in Anderson Valley, um, and it would be up to that owner to certify if they wanted to. But it is farmed biodynamically. I mean, we we work with them quite intensely, um, but it would be their choice. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, 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 I mostly here. agree with. Huh? So that's uh, what was, uh, we're um, having a question um, from, from Mark uh, about the difference between sustainable wine growing and organic in Sonoma or in Sonoma <laughs> Coast. 
<laughs> All right. We, more, we, more, more paperwork, less paperwork. Yeah, you may, you may want to um, blank out this stuff before Dominic explains why, why he does it. Um, okay. Sustainable means absolutely nothing. As far as I'm concerned, the whole Sonoma sustainable thing is kind of a joke there. You heard it from me and I apologize if somebody on the call is offended. Well, let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> Good. So Dominic. Yeah, well, I mostly agree with uh, Tate's <clears throat> terms and, you know, that's not to the paperwork. Let's, let's go out and do the, the work in the vineyard. But in my, the, the, the biggest issue I have with the certifications is the, <clears throat> you know, the, like it takes the dynamic away from biodynamics, you know, that it's all, as long as something's certified, it's, it's about, uh, it's about something is written down and it's, it's like, this rule is written down. This rule is written down, like spray, spray work for the soil and all that stuff is written down with even going back to certain dates where you have to do it and mm -hmm. when you can start working it. And, uh, and this, you know, we're working with nature and na nature is not to define. Nature is not following, you know, the rules we schedules. make, yeah. um, the schedules, exactly. And that's, that's my main issue with all the certificates. Um, uh, it, I, not like, I mean, we are very strong and strict if it comes to the credit card wine system, <laughs> you know? but that it's a, it's a different, it's a different subject. It's wine. It's the pig grapes. It's, it's, it's not. You know, it's in the barrel, it's in the cellar, uh, but not dependent on nature, not as much dependent on nature anymore as the growing grape. And um, and that's uh, that's something I just don't like with being certified. Um, if you, like, like Ted said, if you want to see, uh, then come and, and, and watch the vineyards and, uh, and then you will, well, then you will be uh, convinced that by, by what we do, yeah. yeah. Even though it's kind of interesting with you, Dominic, um, because biodynamics is something that you practice, right? Um, but but it, that's that's probably one of the bigger breaks from the the very tradition of Kula Ruprecht uh, in terms of methods in the vineyard and in the winery, right? I mean, organic. Yeah, yeah, it's, probably, it's not a. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no herbicide for the last 60, 60 years. There, yeah, no, uh, there, organic, but, but biodynamics weren't really part of the portfolio. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Burnt, uh, believe, he never believed in cow shit. And uh, but you can only you know you can only do it if you believe in it. <laughs> so yeah. so it's one of the reasons they they never did it. And uh, and if you know if we do it, then uh, then only the, the few people who believe it don't do it, and not, yeah. not necessarily our our um, Polish helpers. I mean, they, they just don't know what they do, and they, so they don't do it. So it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's the people who do it who, who believe in it. Yeah. And um, there's no there's an impact on like Ted asked the question for the you know the, the age of the, the soil the age of the vineyards not the age of the vineyards but the, how long the vineyards are, the, the soil is used for vineyards and uh, it's one of the methods I believe is uh, that that that's one of the ways to get the vitality back or vitality back into the into the vineyard the life back into the, the vineyard and into the broader then later on uh, one of the, the few things we we can, we can do, and we uh, we uh, we, uh, we you know we can we can do that without a big you know a, a major step, you know, yeah. yeah, and it doesn't have a lot of impact. It hasn't, in my belief, that there's an impact on the wine on the fermentation, but not too much on the flavors and not too much on the on the style of wine. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, um, Constantine, yeah. I, have, I have a question. Um, I want to mention one thing um, before we forget is that some people on the on the call may wonder, you know, why these two very different wineries are associated here, um, and and that is because Dominic and I have known each other for a very long time. Um, uh, Dominic had worked for us at Literai for a harvest back in 2006, and we became really close friends at that time and stayed friends. And then I have a great story about Dominic helping us out in Burn Cottage in New Zealand. And Dominic will remember this, he'll probably smile. Um, but 
we a lot of the soils in central Otago, right, are 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 very wind blown, highly eroded, low fertility, low organic matter soils with very little growing on them. And so if you're creating a vineyard in, in central Otago, it's actually quite helpful to work the soil and to work it a fair amount, just to try to build up uh, through cover cropping as Dominic alluded to, et cetera, um, soil till and humus, et cetera. And so we wanted to work the soil rows, work the rows, the vine rows, right? It's at Burn Cottage. And so we got some equipment from Germany that's very well known and been around for a long time for working the vine rows. But you know, it's, it's good German equipment. You need to be thoughtful and you need to know how to use it. And a certain amount of subtlety is involved. You don't just get on the tractor and you know, hit the go button um, and have it work automatically. And we couldn't get the crew to do it right. We just couldn't get the crew, no matter how hard we tried, it's called a Clemens. The Clemens has a bunch of different uh, fittings that goes on it, but it's a, it's a vine row tilling setup. And so I asked Dominic to come down one year and help us at Burn Cottage. And Dominic was kind enough to come down and spend, I don't remember Dominic, it was, must've been more than a week, literally sitting out there in the rows with the guys on the tractors, helping them to get it right. And just getting them up to understanding the machine and how it worked and all that stuff. And it was, it was just a great experience of, you know, we all think of wine culture as being related, but you go to different countries and, and how they function and how they interact with their farming is really different. So Dominic, thanks again for doing that. That was really awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. <laughs> yeah I, got one, I got one question because we heard like uh, um, that Tad gathered all his uh, training years in Europe and, and took it over uh, um, uh, to, to the States and to build up his own winery and uh, Dominic uh, worked abroad in the States as well as, uh, is there something you picked up there and took it back to this traditional, tradition driven um, company at home in Kaltstadt to, to uh, loosen it up somehow or? Well, I mean, you, you always learn a lot of things and mainly you, you, know, you learn the things how not to do it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> When you're back home. Right? Um, but uh, no, just joking. It's, uh, There's a lot of, you know, there's a few things, not, not a lot of things. There's a lot of things I learned for life, uh, but I, there's a few things I learned in where the U.S., uh, I think especially the U.S. is ahead of us. Is like, you know, what, watching the vineyards with the, you know, the back with the NASA, with the, um, you know, the, um, the activity of the chlorophyll and all that stuff. That's, mm -hmm. and the water, since they always have water issues and that, watching the vineyards from space basically to see how how things go and that's something which is not really happening here not yet it's coming with a climate change that's something which which uh, which was uh, impressive for me uh, for sure and also there's a uh, one side effect for the and now ted mentioned the tractor driving but uh, <laughs> what what i what i like is uh, is or i i especially there is more like an economic economical thing is that uh, you have a lot of contractors you know farming the vineyard the way you do want them to do and uh, and here and in, in, you know everyone has their own tractor maybe two and, and especially if it's a fence life is perfect um, but if you make the calculation um, you need about 50 hectares to run a fence maybe maybe more than that and then you need to run it for 10 years We have 12 hectares, and that's something which the, the U.S. especially, I think, is, is ahead of us by having teams and having companies doing the labor for, you know, to use the machine and, and, and save money on that side. That's something I, I think uh, I, I quite learned. I know I learned, of course, I learned a few things from Ted uh, if it comes to the, <laughs> the Pinot making, <laughs> maybe some Chardonnay as well. <laughs> <laughs> But does it does it apply to your day to day work? I mean, uh, Dominic, as a as a Riesling, well, you obviously working with different grape varieties as well, but Riesling is really yeah, I, it does a little bit not to the Riesling, but you know, since we also make a little bit of Pinot Noir, um, which is like the playground. We have like if you come to a winery like Pinot you cannot change things, not, not philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
you do have a playground in that Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So there's, uh, I mean, Riesling is something we we know how to do it, and there's uh, there can be way better Pinot and, and, and Chardonnay from Germany. So that's kind of the, the little playground uh, I have here, <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. and, and, and play around a little bit with. Yeah, yeah. But the main the main uh, thing I went uh, to work with Tate was. Uh, was first, first of all, it's been one of the, the best pinots I've had in, in, from California. And the sec, second, uh, second of all was like to, to see how the biodynamic farming really works in a, in a, in a surrounding as, as, as a more or less as a farm project and not only block by block vineyards, you know, yeah. I gotta say the um, Saumagen Auslese is really singing now. Um, Beautiful wine, and and the amazing thing about it is really uh, this combination of, of fruit and yeasty flavors, and this mm -hmm. bright bright acidity that breaks all of this. I mean, there's quite a lot of body there, but but it's yeah. really been broken up by by uh, the fresh acidity. That, that that, breaks that's the, the beauty of 2016. That's mm -hmm. uh, it has basically there's not much missing in it. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a little I'm a little I, I I'm not afraid that there won't I mean, I mean the vintages are good and, and, and getting better but this is this is special yeah i don't i don't think i need to have a plan b i think i can stay in the winery for a little longer <laughs> maybe the plan magnum <laughs> um, the only the only time dominic and i experienced wines maybe a little bit sharper than riesling was he and i went to uh, the Jurançon. Uh, a few years ago, and uh, Petit Monsang is quite the quite the palate ripper. That's for sure. Remember that? Company? That was yeah. oh, oh, that is something. <laughs> the acidity in a in the dry Chardonnay is uh, is something uh, very special. <laughs> <laughs> I think after after a day of that, Constantin, I had a new definition for palate um, masochism. Right? It was like okay. Dry Petit Monsang, that'll wake you right up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After being in the Yoha before, right? After right, the... exactly. <laughs> it's definitely in the AM, right? <laughs> um, I got, a, got another question for you, Ted, because um, we, we uh, Dominic just alluded to the whole uh, climate change situation, and obviously that affects everyone all around the world. That's kind of, um, yeah, that's at, at the core of it. Um, of it. But, but in California, obviously, right now there 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 was quite a lot or for the last few months, at least there was quite a lot of press about about the fires. And I think the seventeen, I mean, this you you weren't touched in seventeen, I think, because the fires were quite late. But but uh, can you maybe just tell us a little bit about the situation right now uh, with regards to the fire fires and um, and for me, what is really interesting is what 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 can winemakers do in the future to kind of combat it, um, to yeah. make sure that it doesn't influence. Yeah, you know. I, it's a big subject, but just very quickly, since we're already at an hour, what I would say is that um, I, I drove through Napa Valley um, two weeks ago, everyone, and of course I live right next door in a sense, and I knew that it had been touched. I, I was very sobered by my drive um, from Calistoga down uh, to south of St. Helena and then back over to Santa Rosa. Um, the extent of the damage was pretty shocking. Um, and we've been living with this now really since 2015. That was the first, that was the Valley Fire up in Lake County. And um, so we, yeah, we feel like we're on the cutting edge of climate change, right? That we're really experiencing it in a dramatic way, much like they expected through catastrophic events, right? And the subtler events, if we all start picking earlier and things like that, I mean, that's nothing compared to floods or wildfires, et cetera. And um, we just, we have an enormous fuel load because California hasn't burned for so long because once, once the white people came here, we really suppressed fire completely, right? It was not allowed to happen. Whereas the indigenous community had in fact been cultivating fire for thousands of years throughout, um, throughout all of the West in the United States. So um, we, we have a lot to learn. All right, yeah. That's that's um, I'm I'm uh, yeah. It's it's just it's just such a such an obvious um, well. 
way of seeing uh, climate change. Actually, in Germany, when it comes to wine, we we obviously, I mean, we are all worried about climate change as well. But when it comes to wine, it probably has uh, impacted us rather in a positive way, where we in some regions uh, where we didn't, didn't. I agree. I agree on that, Constantine. If it comes to the wine product, the, the quality yeah. of the but not in the vineyards. So we, we do yeah. have our vineyards, yeah. But if it comes to the quality, 100%, yes, we benefit 100%, yeah. No. So what is it you are doing, Dominic, to kind of um, um, work <clears throat> against climate change again? You know, we, we do work, you know, the canopy is not as high as it used to be in the <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. So we don't, you know, we, we try to, uh, we try to, do not leaf plucking. We try to keep the grapes in shade, in shade as long as possible. And uh, and then there is a few things we you know we try to keep the the, the soil cooler by by having the, a real working cover crop and keep the, the moist in the soil. And in some vineyards we do need to do in the younger vineyards we do need to do drip irrigation. Uh, that is a okay. that is a must. Is a must if uh, we would if we don't want to lose the, the vines. That is. Uh, that's something which is uh, which is hard, yeah, but it is what it is. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, Constantine, I didn't I didn't mean to go too big picture on you. We we absolutely are looking to changes in trellis, no question about that, to protect the yeah. fruit wall. Yeah, and we started those experiments a couple of years ago, so um, we're 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 open to everything. The, all cards are on the table for sure. Well, do you also feel that? Uh, the impact of the climate change will also allow you to get into vineyards or into places in, on the Sonoma coast that weren't well, where, where you weren't able to make wine before because it was yeah, yeah. The, there'll be two things. There'll be places that were not viable before, and our average yields will be more commercial, right? So if you look at the the pivot's fine. Um, you could kind of get a sense from the picture that it's a relatively um, mild place, but some of our other sites like the Haven, you know, you're talking about 20 hectares per hectare if you're lucky uh, on average, mm. probably less than that. So, so climate change is a benefit in terms of better set. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Yeah. There was one question for you, Ted, I think, with regards to Chardonnay, even though we are uh, tasting the Pinot, but uh, she was interested in knowing whether you do batonnage and how often in Chardonnay. Oh, yeah, no, no stirring in Chardonnay, no batonnage at all. Um, we just don't, we don't feel like we need it. I think it really is a regional thing, right? If you're, if you're in a place where the Chardonnays are leaner and tighter, maybe you want to do some, but we don't feel like we need to. Yeah, so we stay away. Yeah. All right. Yeah, quite do a we have any. Right? <laughs> any more questions? Sebastian, anything? Um, no. No? No, I'm thinking. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have said we're, and we're, done. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm sure that we have only touched on all of the topics yeah. that we could have talked about. So, so um, I think that there's, that there's uh, content for another few hours, but but obviously Ted needs to get to work because it's early in the morning. So, so he, he, yeah, get you get your work done. <laughs> we can obviously now relax with uh, those two beautiful wines here in front of us um, here on the German side. But but I think it was it was really uh, interesting to having uh, interesting having you both here because it's. Such a funny thing. I mean, the wine world is is such a big place, and there's so much to learn and know. But um, it's amazing to see that two wineries on on uh, two different sides of the globe, making two completely different wines, still um, still well, wine styles, still still kind of have a lot in common. And and it's obviously great uh, to also know that you are your friends and you've been. Uh, You've worked together, and obviously now Kula Ruprecht is also importing Ted's wine. So if you're if you're in Germany and want to want to um, get some of uh, Ted Ted's wines, then uh, then you can do that through Kula Ruprecht, obviously. But it's great uh, to to see that those friendship, friendships uh, develop in in uh, this wild <laughs> world of wine and. Um, 
And yeah, I think I think we touched upon uh, quite a lot of really interesting su subjects. I'm pretty sure that I'll definitely finish those two glasses tonight. So, so I'm really looking forward to tasting those wines side by side for the rest of the evening. And yeah, I want to say thank you to all of you, Sebastian, Ted, and uh, Dominic, and uh, and thanks for everyone attending. I mean, we had uh, quite a lot of people tuning in, so so that's that's great to see. So thank you very much. Most enjoyable Monday evening. Thank you a lot. So yeah, yeah. thanks for thanks for coming and Constantine. Thanks so much to you both for for uh, sitting in with us. That was really a pleasure. It's been a, a joy, and I knew that Dominic sooner or later would tell me to get to work. I was just waiting for that to come. So <laughs> uh, anyway, I miss you, buddy. We'll see you soon. I hope. Right. Stay safe in the meantime. Right. You as well. Of okay. Course. All right, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Have a lovely evening. Yeah.